Hi, welcome to the Knowledgeably Yours podcast. I'm Kaustik. And in this episode, I want to do some loud thinking about religion using something known as the Prime Directive. So, please stay tuned. So let me begin by first answering the question what the Prime Directive is. So the Prime Directive is an important principle, a law if you want to call it that, from the Star Trek universe. I am going to assume that you have zero knowledge of the Star Trek universe and for the next 5 to 10 minutes I will explain the Prime Directive. So for those of you who are already big fans of the Star Trek universe and know exactly what the Prime Directive is, please bear with me. So Star Trek is a s- series of series. It's a universe in which in which many serials or series have been created starting from 1968. So the first Star Trek series, also known today as the original series, was introduced to the world in 1968. The basic premise of the Star Trek original series was that we are a couple of hundred years into the future. The Earth's individual governments have been dissolved and there is one single united Earth government. Earth has developed the ability to overcome the limitations imposed by the speed of light and have developed a technology known as warp drive which allows it to very easily leave the confines of the solar system and contact civilizations in other star systems and together with some of these civilizations earth is a part of something known as the federation of planets and they have a group known as starfleet And one of the ships in the Starfleet is USS Enterprise. The captain of USS Enterprise is one Captain James T. Kirk, famously played by William Shatner. And he has his first officer, the famous Mr. Spock, played by the legendary Leonard Nimoy. And the basic goal of the USS Enterprise as a ship is to, quoting their own words, boldly go where no one has gone before. And their attempt is to search new civilizations and make contact with as many new civilizations as they can. So as you can see, Star Trek paints a very, very hopeful future where we are able to survive the political nightmare that we find ourselves occasionally in today's day and age. But in the Star Trek universe, it has been shown that we have not gotten there very easily. So in the fictitious history of the Earth painted in the Star Trek universe, we have had a third world war and it is only after facing the consequences of the third world war that we have uh, managed to dissolve our differences and form a united earth government. Anyway, back to uh, Starfleet. One of the important principles in Starfleet is the prime directive. So any member of Starfleet who is serving on one of these ships is bound by the prime directive. And what exactly does the prime directive say? The Prime Directive essentially prohibits interference in the natural evolution of a planet's history. So let's try and understand this with some examples. So imagine that you are a a captain of one of these incredibly powerful starships and as you explore the galaxy you come across a planet. You use your highly sophisticated sensors and notice that there is life on this planet, a humanoid life on this planet. 
you do some very careful stealthy studies and you discover that it is equivalent to the barbaric tribes from the history of our own earth. So in other words, we have a civilization and it is in its very early stages of evolution. So it's full of tribes who are at constant war with each other. So the prime directive says that you will not make direct contact with such a civilization. And the reason for this is that it will cause the it will cause a change, a dramatic change in the future evolution of this particular civilization. And that is what the prime directive prohibits. Let's take another example. Suppose you come across a civilization which is very close in appearance to what today's earth is, which means that we have got some level of sophistication. We understand technology. We think out loud and Hopefully we are intelligent, but we still have uh, all our differences. We have individual governments and we are not yet a united planet, right? And also at the same time, we uh, have the capability of leaving Earth, but we do not have the capability of overcoming the limitations imposed by the speed of light and therefore there is, we cannot imagine getting in touch with a civilization on a planet around a completely different stellar system. So that capability is not there. Once again, the prime directive prohibits you from making contact with this civilization. So in fact, imagine that there is already uh, a federation of planets and we are not yet a part of it and imagine that there are incredibly powerful ships that are able to monitor our progress if they are following something like the prime directive then they will not get in touch with us which could also by the way explain why we haven't been contacted by a superior intelligent life even if it exists so the prime directive is a reasonable explanation for that but the important point here is, or the question that needs to be asked is, where does the prime directive come from? Well, as far as I know, the Star Trek universe creators don't go into explicit detail as to where the prime directive comes from, but it is easy to guess where it comes from, right? So it comes from the lessons learned from history. So the reason that the Earth has a united government in this hopeful future painted by Star Trek is because there has been a catastrophic third world war. And the destruction that it has caused has led people to understand that when too much power is placed in the hands of a civilization that is not yet matured, a lot of destruction can follow as a result. Which also, by the way, there is, there are certain policies which reflect that even in today's day and age. The United Nations, right, which is our first crude attempt, if I may call it, at a United Earth governance structure, prohibits many countries from researching and creating a nuclear arsenal. So there are a handful of countries that have nuclear weapons. But the moment the United Nations is made aware of a new country that is trying to empower itself with nuclear weapons, there's a lot of interference and a lot of resistance. And steps are taken to discourage the new country from acquiring nuclear weapons. And the reason is simple. We don't trust a country that is not yet powerful enough wise enough, matured enough with nuclear power. So, so something similar is happening here with the Prime Directive. Uh, there is a journey that we have to undertake as a civilization, starting from being a collection of barbaric tribes that are constantly at war with each other, and finally reach a point where we learn our lessons, we unite, we devote ourselves to research, 
we develop something like the warp drive and we leave the solar system and make contact with other civilizations. And if there is an external stimulus which accelerates the progress, then we may acquire too much power too fast and will not be ready to wield it properly. And that is what the Prime Directive is addressing. It is a principle that has been derived from a detailed analysis of the history of civilizations across the galaxy. And several wise people have concluded that we must never interfere with the natural evolution of a civilization. So it is not something that you mathematically derive. It is not something that is derived from first principles. It is a distillation of lessons learned over several decades or even centuries. Now, one of the interesting questions that you can ask is, is the prime directive absolute? Is it unviolable? Are there any exceptions? And this has been a very common theme in many of the stories that uh, you find in the various series that make up the Star Trek universe. You've got devoted captains who believe that the prime directive is completely unviolable. You cannot make an exception. And then there are characters who will argue that the prime directive is a very ruthless, dogmatic doctrine. For example, imagine that you are a medical doctor and there is a civilization in front of you which is about to get completely wiped out. If you decide to break the prime directive, you can introduce yourself and you can use your medical technology to cure whatever plague or disease is affecting that civilization and threatens to wipe it out completely. But the prime directive will prevent you from doing that. And there's very interesting uh, debates in the Star Trek series, both original as well as the subsequent series, where characters actually debate on whether the prime directive is absolute and whether there are situations in which the prime directive appears very barbaric. But you will find people who will stick their ground and say, no, we cannot violate this directive. Over and over again, we have learned that if the prime directive is violated, even if it appears to do some short-term good, there is always long-term consequences that are never good. This is the conviction, this is the faith of many wise people in this Star Trek universe. When they when, when they are faced with a situation where they feel like they should violate the Prime Directive. So the question that came to my mind uh, recently is, isn't Prime Directive a religion? And I'd like to argue that it is. So let's take any arbitrary religion as we can find it today, right? The West has its share of three major religions. The East has its share of religions. But no matter what religion you take, you find certain common themes. Most religions argue that it is important to speak the truth. Most religions believe in some form of charity. Most religions believe in drawing boundaries. So boundaries with respect to your property, for example, there's a clear commandment, a well-known commandment which says that you should not covet another person's property, you should not steal. Almost all religions tell you to, tell you to have a ceremony known as a marriage, which, which basically creates a certain boundary, right? It, it gives exclusive rights to a man over a woman or vice versa and any violation of that is considered terrible. So the point is that 
Any given religion can be argued to be a collection of principles or a collection of directives and the people who believe in that religion will tell you that there is something sacred about those principles, something sacred about those directives. They are inviolable. And when the question is asked, where did this come from? Where did these principles or directives come from? There are different answers. Some religions will create mythological stories where a character named God appeared and handed over these religion religious principles. Uh, some religions will not exactly comment on where it came from and will just tell you that these are natural laws of the universe that have just been discovered by wise people in the past. So different answers are given, but what matters in the end is that at least to the people of those religions, who belong to those religions, these are inviolable principles or directives. And they will also tell you that in the short term, you might find that violating these laws can give you some benefit. For civilization, in the long term, it is not correct or it is very devastating to violate these principles. And where did it come from? I'd like to believe that all of these religious principles come from a self-examination of our history. I believe it was the very wise and astute Jordan Peterson who once pointed out that a gentleman named Moses was in a desert with these very desperate group of people who were constantly probably disputing with each other all the time and he was trying to settle their disputes and one one day he decides to come with the Ten Commandments. The story is more supernatural of course. Moses climbs to a certain mountain and is given the revelation of the Ten Commandments by God himself but you could always pour you know, paint a more realistic version of it or a more believable version of it, wherein Moses was observing the reasons for the disputes, the lack of harmony in a tribe and then decided to carve out or deduce or derive 10 principles, 10 commandments, 10 laws, which if followed by people could ensure long-term harmony and peace for the people following these laws. I like to think that almost all religions, when they propose a set of laws, a certain set of rituals, certain principles, it is not random. They may claim that there is some supernatural origin and which also may not be really a wrong thing to say because when I say that there are these hundred rules that make up religion Y, ten rules that make up religion Z, and if I ask the question, where did it come from? To think, if you think about it, they come from nowhere, right? There is not like a source of knowledge where you connect your cable and draw the information out using by hitting an enter key or clicking a mouse. There is no source for this. It's it's the source is unexplainable. So in that very, very loose sense, the source is supernatural, right? It doesn't come from anywhere. It just presents itself. We know it is true. Why do we know it is true? We just know it is true. We can't logically derive that you must speak the truth. You take the assertion that you must speak the truth and then you can weave stories about the power of being able to tell the truth or the disastrous consequences of not speaking the truth. And similarly, why should you not lust after another man's wife? Well, I can't derive a principle saying you can't do it, right? It's I can only weave stories, narrations, narratives, where I can tell you that if you violate this very simple principle, what are the consequences? What kind of disharmony is created in civilization as a result of not following that particular law. And, and that's all it is. It is a collection of statements. Where did they come from? They came from experience. But if you wanted to paint a source, well, there's no one source. It's, it's just there. It's, it has presented itself. 
Now, I don't claim to be someone who actually has spent a great deal of time academically studying the origin of religions, but I feel that this is how intuitively religions present themselves, just the way the prime directive was a distillation of the history of civilizations in the Star Trek universe, major world religions or even minor world religions are distillations of experiences of humanity. But the problem is that many religions also attempt to answer questions that they may not be designed to answer. And the simplest example is you look at the sky and you ask, is the sky, why is the sky blue? And one religion may have a mythological explanation as to why the sky is blue. Another religion may paint some other answer for you. Or maybe they'll say that when God created the earth, he decided that the sky as a blue would be a great color. Any explanation could be offered. But you ask, present these, you can present these explanations to a scientist who is now the dominant authority in today's day and age. And you ask the scientist, why is the sky blue? And pop comes the answer, Rayleigh scattering. Electromagnetic spectrum, Rayleigh scattering. These are the explanations that we have for why the sky is blue. Similarly, why does the sun shine? Well, nuclear fusion reactions uh, made possible by the collapse of giant gas clouds under the force of their own gravity and triggering nuclear reactions using the laws of quantum mechanics and quantum tunneling, blah, blah, blah. We could give a detailed explanation for this. And because a lot of religious assertions can now be easily challenged by modern science, it has now become a fashion, it has become a trend to ridicule religions, to deride religions. And yes, if there's a religious explanation for why a certain physics problem presents itself, the religious explanation indeed appears to be a very, very crude attempt to answer the question, while the scientific rigorous analysis appears to be the correct way to do it. But remember that science has not yet endeavored to explain how we should be acting out ourselves, how we should be acting our lives out. How should we conduct ourselves when we interact with each other on a social level or as a family? Or how exactly should the duties be distributed between the husband, the wife and the kids and the grandparents and the grandkids? Science has not endeavored in that direction yet. Maybe in the future it will, but it hasn't yet. And maybe it will. And there's a chance that it may not because there is a scientific process that is at the heart of science and it can only answer questions of a certain kind and many of these questions may not even be eligible for the application of the scientific method. So the question is, how do we conduct ourselves now? And I submit to you, I argue that the best wisdom that you could gather on how we should conduct ourselves, how we should behave will come from religions. And at least when it comes to describing human endeavors, at least when it comes to describing how we should behave and how we should treat each other, there is nothing blind or superstitious about religions. I believe that every religious principle or collection of principles is a distillation, is, an, is a result of the analysis, self-analysis of historical outcomes. And the reason that most religions are accompanied by stories is because if you wanted to explain the relevance or the importance of a particular religious directive or dictum, a story is the best way to do it. And that's how Star Trek does it. It doesn't give you a lecture on what the prime directive is. It gives you stories in which you are forced to think about where the prime director succeeds where it fails. And similarly, 
you find stories in religions and the purpose of these stories in my opinion is to challenge you to think as to why certain religious truths are the indeed true but i but it has become a fashion uh, these days to look at that story from a very literal angle and say no the story is false why is it false because the events that are described in the story are physically impossible the splitting of the oceans the holding of a mountain on the edge of a finger all these are impossible things and therefore this this story is false but but that's not the point of the story is it even star trek is false but that doesn't stop star trek from forcing you to think about what is right and what is wrong and that i believe is the purpose of all religious stories so as a conclusion to this very loud thought process that i have done in this podcast i would only say that this fashion of bashing religions is a useless endeavor we have to embrace religions for what they are and attempt to best distill the wisdom of the ages into a set of principles and then an attempt to explain those principles through various stories and narratives and we don't have as far as i can tell a proper substitute for these principles and i don't think we can ever use techniques or science to derive from some kind of first principles a collection of laws which will govern our behavior and i think religion will continue to to fill that void for many many years to come and the correct way to treat religion is generally with a broad sense of respect a curiosity a, a challenge to our notions and we must endeavor to study whatever religion affects us in the most way and try to make sense of it and have some faith that there is a lot of wisdom embedded in some of the assertions of various religions but yes uh, i also don't advocate blind faith all I, all i am proposing is that we not bash religions blindly having armed ourselves with the knowledge of scientific truth and scientific techniques or scientific methods so in other words uh, religions are relevant and we should be a bit more broad minded about evaluating their rel- their relevance in our daily lives thank you so much for tuning in i'll hope to see you next time